you know, when we faced our darkest hour, when, you know, Europe had been defeated on all fronts, France had fallen, Belgium had fallen, Holland had fallen, most of Western Europe had just within weeks been steamrolled by the German Blitzkrieg. Even at that moment, Churchill said, we must not concentrate purely on our defences. That's why France fell. That's why most of Western Europe fell. Attack is the best form of defence, and we have to go back and take the war to the enemy. An excerpt from today's guest, who's written a riveting account of the early days of the British SAS in World War II. Sunday Times best-selling author Damien Lewis is here, and I'll speak with him right after this break. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. Gift-giving season is here, and for the military history lover on your list, check out my book about the Black Medal of Honor recipients of World War II. Immortal Valor chronicles these timeless heroes' life journeys through all the pain and struggle until their ultimate triumphs. I hope you purchase the book or audiobook, which is available now in stores and online. Welcome back. And before we get into the show, remember to click that follow button on the podcast to be notified of our future fantastic guests like the author we're speaking with today. And thank you. Today's guest is a former war correspondent and one of Britain's 20 favorite authors, as declared by World Book Day. He's an acclaimed and award-winning author, topping bestseller lists worldwide. Many of his books are currently being produced for film and television. His latest book is called S.A.S. Brothers in Arms, Churchill's Desperados, Blood and Guts Defiance at Britain's Darkest Hour. And author Damien Lewis joins us now. Damien, welcome to the show. Great to be with you. Reading the background on this book, this book in itself could make its own great story, the discovery of the underlying materials. Could you tell us about how this book came to be and the chronicles of the unit and how they started in Germany? Yeah, so it's, it's, you say it's an extraordinary story. Uh, in May '45, um, the Special Air Service, uh, you know, Britain Special Forces, former Special Forces at the time, were fighting their way into Germany at the vanguard of Allied forces, and they were um, largely driving, riding in these Willy Streeps, some of the American-made Willy Street, which they swore by, very versatile vehicle. Uh, mounted with with machine guns, Lewis guns, and, and also Brownings, and they were ambushed and ended up in a bloody and bruising firefight near a a town called Schneeren in northern Germany, during which four SAS were either captured or killed. And in fact, the guy who was captured was then uh, basically executed in cold, cold blood. So they lost at least four guys. Uh, they had wounded. And, and they lost vehicles. It was a very bruising confrontation, especially at this very late stage of the war. When they took the town of Schneeren, they discovered this enormous, massive, leather-clad tome of a book, which was the chronic, das chronic. Of, and, and, and basically a chronic was given by Hitler to those towns which he wished to kind of record the glories of the Third Reich. And so, you know, in typical Maverick SAS style, they decided to steal it, booty of war, uh, and they uh, loaded it aboard the jeeps, which were piled high with, with uh, you know, other booty, mostly booze, and they and they and they carried it back to the UK and eventually back to um, the home of the commander of one SAS, who was the longest standing commander of the SS in the war, who was Colonel Blair uh, Paddy Main who was the Irishman, of course, who would end up winning four Distinguished Service Orders DSO during the war. So arguably the most highly decorated uh, British military, uh, British Army uh, soldier of the Second World War. And so the chronic of Schneeren Town ended up in his home in Northern Ireland. And in due course, because the SS was never very popular with high command for reasons we can go into, and in due course, they were disbanded in October 1945, and that was supposed to be the end of this kind of maverick piratical soldiering for good. But those who had, um, you know, founded and nurtured the regiment were not willing to see at least its history die. And so they removed the pages of that massive, massive um, tome, the chronic. And instead, they they used the cover to to um, to mount 
all the records of the SS during the war. So this just what wasn't just like, you know, war diaries and mission reports and all the things you would expect. It was also letters, personal letters, letters home to uh, in those who'd lost loved ones, uh, photographs, newspaper cuttings. It was like an incredible living record of the history of this unit over the five years that they had served on these countless back to back missions behind enemy lines. And then that 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 tome. So what was the chronic of Schneeren, which had now become the de facto SAS war diary, was hidden away in, in, in Maine's home for the next several decades because, one, the SAS has been disbanded, and two, none of these records were supposed to be kept, certainly not by uh, private individuals. And so um, in that way, miraculously, uh, the history of the SAS at war was, was preserved and safeguarded. And it was the Maine family... Um, because Colonel Maine sadly died uh, when he was just 45 in a motorcycle accident. So his family reached out to me about 10 years ago and said, you know, would you like to come and not only, um, you know, see the chronic, but also um, the war chests that Maine bought back from those five years at war. So these were these massive wooden trunks stuffed full of documents and memorabilia and photographs and, and even undeveloped film. And so, of course, you know, I was uh, hugely honoured and accepted. And, and it's as a result of that that I became fascinated in this individual and that period of SAS operations and the book was written. It's amazing. You reference this Churchill's relationship with the SAS was very close. And that wasn't the same in the upper echelon. Could you speak to that? Yeah, so Churchill was, you know, this visionary um, exceptional, um, unparalleled leader, uh, especially in, well, particularly in terms of British and Allied fortunes at the start of the war. The more you study the period, or I study the period, you know, when we faced our darkest hour, when, you know, Europe had been defeated on all fronts, France had fallen, Belgium had fallen, Holland had fallen, most of Western Europe had just within weeks been steamrolled by the German Blitzkrieg. And, and, and really Britain stood alone. At that moment, you know, Churchill only recently came to power, you know, just days after uh, after the miracle of Dunkirk and snatching all the British and Allied soldiers from the French beaches and saving our armies. And just days after that, Churchill was surrounded by politicians and commanders who, if we're honest about it, believe we should cut a deal with Hitler, that some kind of peace deal was possible and that Britain could never stand against the onslaught. And Churchill with very few, very few allies, I have to say, was adamant that no such thing was going to pass. And not only that, what made him truly exceptional, in my view, was that not only was he absolutely determined that Hitler, that gutter snipe, as he called him, was going to be defeated and Nazism would be vanquished, but not only that, he, he at that most difficult time when we believed that Operation Sea Line, the invasion of Britain, was about to be launched, the Battle of Britain was already upon us when... You know, the, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, tried to uh, bomb and uh, and use their fighter aircraft to bring Britain to its knees. Even at that moment, Churchill said, we must not we must not concentrate purely on our defences. That's why France fell. That's why most of Western Europe fell. Attack is the best form of defence. And we have to go back and take the war to the enemy wherever and wherever they are. And so he, with the aid of one or two maverick commanders, uh, you know, one of whom was Colonel Dudley Cart, this visionary, um, you know, really at this very early stage of the war, he came up with the idea of what they termed at that stage the special service volunteers, what initially became the commandos. And these were, as, they, as it sounds, volunteers who basically stepped forward for what they were only told were hazardous duties. They had no idea really what they were volunteering for. And this was the start of the invention of this completely new way of waging war. You know, operations by small bands of, of highly motivated, highly trained men deep behind the enemy lines who, who Churchill, you know, urged to, to butcher and bolt on these snatch and, snatch and grab operations. The idea of which was not to stand and fight. The idea of which was to spread uncertainty and terror and, and, and to destroy the morale of the enemy wherever they were to such a degree that... that, that that no one, no matter what their rank, ever felt safe and no matter where they were on the front line or deep behind 
their own front lines. And this was the new concept. And on the back of that, in the North African deserts, when, when you know, we uh, British forces, British and allied forces faced, faced off against G General Rommel and the Africa Corps in 1940 and 1941. So on the back of that concept of these commandos, we saw the birth, birth of the Special Air Service Regiment in the North African desert, which was formed specifically to use the desert like, like an empty ocean almost to insert small bands of raiders deep behind the lines and cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. And so Churchill, you know, from the very outset felt, uh, felt almost a personal authorship of these kind of operations. And right until the end of the war and even after the war, he maintained this very, very deep and personal relationship with all those who were involved. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Next time, New York Times bestselling author Tom Cliven will be here. Both sides were basically told, and certainly the Germans were told, you can't, you, you, there can't be no surrender. You, you, you have to hold this hill at all costs. The commanders even offered incentives, like everybody will get an Iron Cross in two weeks off if, if you hold this hill. There was not a similar incentive given to the first, Second Ranger Battalion. It was more like, you guys are it. Another reason to click that follow button to be notified when the episode releases. And before we return to the conversation, if you're enjoying this story from World War II, check out our earlier program, Against All Odds, with New York Times bestselling author Alex Kershaw. Each of the guys I write about, every one of their actions, the actions they performed to gain the Medal of Honor saved a lot of lives. If they hadn't done what they did, a lot of guys would have died. Right. And that was their primary motivation. They weren't thinking, I'm going to get a medal, I'm going to be in the headlines. They were thinking... There's a hell of a lot of guys around me that I love, that I'm responsible for, that I've got to save their lives. It's show 152 from season two, and you'll easily find it in our past episodes. What would you consider during their service in World War II their most impactful mission, and perhaps one that didn't go the way they had planned? Well, I suppose really the most um, standout mission has to be the second that they ever undertook, and I'll explain why. So, you know, they were formed in the summer of, of, of 1941, and their first mission, codenamed Operation Squatter, which was a airborne insertion by parachute um, in, in the autumn of 41, was an absolute, absolute disaster. Through no fault of their own, what happened was the night of the operation, this unbelievable desert storm blew up. There'd been nothing like it in living memory. They really shouldn't have dropped. They went ahead with the mission anyway because they felt, felt they had to prove themselves because, as I said, they were not popular with high command who wanted to get rid of them, so they really had to go and prove themselves at war. And so they jumped into the, into the deserts anyway, deep behind enemy lines, to try to pull off this series of raids on these enemy air bases. And, of course, um, it, none of those were successful. The reason being that, you know, the winds were so high, you know, 30 knots or so, that they shouldn't have jumped in the first place and many were injured and killed and those that did actually end up on the ground the the, the the conditions were so atrocious the desert was flooded transformed into these raging torrents no one could actually get near their targets and so because that was so so utterly disastrous the second set of of operations that they undertook just a month later were make or break they they believed, and I think rightly, that they were about to be disbanded because of that first first failure. And they believed absolutely painfully that if they didn't pull off this second set of missions, then 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 the SAS would be no more. So in other words, the unit would have never really actually ever struck home before it was done away with with those uh, in high command with whom they were not popular. So that second sec set of operations, during which they struck a series of air bases along the uh, Mediter North African Mediterranean coast were, were, as I say, absolutely do or die. And, you know, they changed their modus operandi, which was a key thing. They no longer went in via air because they realised it was far too risky. Instead, they were they were ferried to target by the men of the Long Range Desert Group, which was this uh, desert reconnaissance specialist uh, unit set up by the British at the start of the war. And so it was in that way that they got to their targets. They then went in on foot, carried out this series of absolutely spectacular raids on these enemy airfields, blew up dozens of enemy enemy, enemy uh, warplanes, got every man out alive, absolute standout runaway success, and proof of concept that the idea behind the SAS um, 
would pass muster. And that meant, of course, that they'd bought their own survival. Tell us a little bit more about Paddy Maine. What type of a commander was he? So Maine was recruited right at the start of the S. He's one of the originals, and he was recruited by David Sterling, the founder of, of the SAS. And Sterling wanted Maine um, for, for, for several reasons. One, the pedigree of these guys was largely the commandos, and it was largely number seven, eight, and 11 commando who'd been deployed to North Africa, um, had a string of largely aborted missions, but Maine and, and, and a, a number of the other early recruits had actually carried out a mission, an amphibious landing in Syria in the summer of, of 1941, and that had been successful. High casualty rate, um, you know, unbelievable odds, but actually they'd achieved their aims. And so Sterling wanted Maine because he was battle experienced and he already had knowledge of those kind of operations. And he also wanted him because he sensed that Maine was the kind of um, individual who would inspire the men in the unit to follow him into the teeth of hell, which is basically where they were where they were charged to go. If you can imagine setting forth into the Sahara, where there's no water, there's no human settlements, there's nothing to eat. You know, if, if, if you get lost or trapped or your vehicle breaks down, your chances of survival are very low indeed added to which you're heading deep behind enemy enemy lines. So you're going to be hunted largely from the air all the way if they find out you're there. And they certainly will if you carry out your mission. So to get individuals to undertake those kind of against all odds operations, you needed inspirational figures. And Sterling believed Maine would be one of the uh, one of the officers who could do that. And indeed, from the very get go, what what distinguished men, I guess, above just about any other commander that, that one studies during the war was he had this almost unique ability to do several things. One was to assess in the blink of an eye the level of danger he and his unit faced and to make instant split second decisions, what flight or flight, do we stand or fight? Do, 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 we, do, we, do we make tracks? Because the SAS's raison d'etre wasn't to engage in combat. It's crucial to understand that it was not to engage in combat. It was to emerge from the darkness, raid an enemy target, whether it be an airfield, a port or a wireless station or a bomb dump below the place to smithereens. Yes, there would be enemy casualties, doubtless, in the process. And then to disappear as quickly as they had come, disappearing like cats in the night, because that was the way to live to fight another day, but also to spread the fear of God into the enemy because these are the raiders they never saw and indeed it was very successful but it took a certain kind of individual you can imagine to command men to do that and Maine had that instinct in him in spadefuls so that's one of the reasons he proved such a standout commander apart from of course his innate warrior instinct and his bravery and the second reason why he was um, just an incredible leader of men in these extreme circumstances was because he cared. He cared deeply for the men under his command uh, in a way that is, is exceptional. Uh, you know, you very rarely come across this. This was not something he acted. This was not something he put on for show. He was certainly not that kind of individual. individual. He was a very, you know, uh, understated, genuine individual. He didn't suffer fools. But Maine had this genuine, heartfelt care for those he commanded. And because of that, and because this was visible, people could see it. Those under his command would follow him to the ends of the earth and beyond. And because of those those, those aspects of his character, and you, all the accounts I've read of those those people who served with him, it, it was it's extraordinary because they all say, for some reason, you felt safe with him. He could take you into hell itself, you know. And you still felt that with him, you would somehow get out alive. So he was this utterly standout figure um, in the history of the SAS. And of course, after David Sterling was captured and David Sterling was a visionary leader in, in his own right. He was the founder of the unit. He was the man who had the idea. In a sense, he had the ideas. Maine made them happen. But, you know, when David Sterling was captured in 1943, captured by the enemy, who, of course, you know, were hunting the SAS with a vengeance. When Sterling was captured, it was Maine who stepped forward to take over command. And to follow up on that, 
You have a sequel that you're planning, or you're probably writing right now, following Patty's men later in the war. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so after um, you know the capture of David Sterling, February 1943, uh, Sterling and most of his patrol, um, you know, no one knew Sterling's fate. Obviously, he had just disappeared. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the Rommel put out a German general Rommel put out a very triumphant statement. You know, that Sterling had the phantom major, as they called him, had been captured. But no one knew the truth until three of the men had been on Sterling's patrol executed one of the most incredible, mind blowing escapes and evasion of the war. So they managed to get away from the patrol that captured Sterling and most of his patrol and get back to Allied lines. And then it was confirmed, of course, that Sterling has been had been captured. And at that stage, many feared the SAS was finished because for a start, the founder, the visionary, the man who made it happen, David Sterling, was gone. And secondly, the desert war was pretty much over. The Africa Corps had been defeated. The Americans had landed with the Operation Torch landings. There'd been the pincer movement between American and British forces. North Africa was pretty much won. And many people argued the desert was the only place for raiders such as these. They were formed in the desert. They were of the desert. And with the, with the death of the desert war, the SAS should also die. And so there was this... There was this real move to to force them back into a unit like the commandos. And it was Maine who stepped forward to argue otherwise. And it was Maine who said, no, we have a role to play because the, uh, during the coming landings, the, pl the planned landings in, North, in, in southern Italy, Operation Husky, you're going to need specialist troops to get ashore, the, the tip of the spear, and we could form that tip of the spear. And so the, the sequel of the book begins with those operations. It follows the operations of the SAS as, as they liberate southern Italy, dr the drive into northern Italy, and then, of course, beyond that, the operations they did in, on D-Day and right the way through to Germany itself. The book is called SAS Brothers in Arms, Churchill's Desperados. Damien, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for joining me. Next time, New York Times bestselling author Tom Cleveland will be here. Both sides were basically told, and certainly the Germans were told, you can't, you, you, there can't be no surrender. You, you, you have to hold this hill at all costs. The commanders even offered incentives, like everybody will get an Iron Cross and two weeks off if, if you hold this hill. There was not a similar incentive given to the first, second Ranger Battalion. It was more like, you guys are it. Another reason to click that follow button to be notified when the episode releases. And if you like what you hear, leave a review or a rating or just click the follow button. And be sure to check out our Point of the Spear YouTube channel with bonus video material plus full military history documentaries. There's tons to explore, and I hope you check it out. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.